one of the world's largest ever carnivorous marsupials, a 25 kilogram apex predator of continental Australia. Its back decorated with iconic black bands that formed a ladder across its dense fur. This creature was shy but fierce, a fascinating animal that humans ruthlessly hunted to extinction less than 100 years ago. Take a picture of this dog-like marsupial today and you might just earn yourself over one million dollars. This is the thylacine. Or should I call it the Tasmanian wolf? Perhaps the Tasmanian tiger? These are all names for the same creature, known scientifically as Thylacinus cynocephalus, which translates to dog-headed pouched dog. For something that isn't a dog, it has the word in its name a fair bit. Here's something odd about the thylacine that I love. Its uniqueness is largely owed to how ununique it looked. It's quite ironic. I'm referring, of course, to a phenomenon known as convergent evolution. This is when two or more unrelated species evolve similar traits completely separately from one another. Thylacines are an extreme and fascinating example of convergent evolution. They evolved so similarly to wolves that modern researchers still struggle to tell their skeletons apart. This is despite thylacine belonging to a completely different group of mammals known as marsupials and evolving in Australia, which didn't see the likes of the canine family until about 6,000 years ago, when Asian seafarers introduced the dingo. The thylacine's striking resemblance to the canine family is impressive to say the least, but remember, this only goes as far as their immediate appearance. Thylacines were far from dogs, the main difference being that they were marsupials, not placental mammals. Yes, this means that like all marsupials, female thylacines possessed pouches for raising their young. But strangely enough, male thylacines had pouches too. This is incredibly rare and only seen in one marsupial alive today, the water opossum. These male pouches were not used for embryonic development, but instead to protect their testicles from the cold and from other males biting or scratching at their precious jewels. Thylacines differed from both dogs and cats in the way that they ran. Unlike the canine and feline families, thylacines accelerated by hopping on their hind legs. They then returned to a quadrupedal stance before gaining speeds of up to 25 miles per hour. That's fast, but slightly below the speed you'd expect from, say, a dog of a similar size. This is largely to do with the proportions of their legs. The tibia was longer than that of dogs, and the tarsus was shorter. Large pads extended up the tarsus, a trait usually seen in climbing marsupials, although there is no evidence that thylacines climbed. Their toes were smaller than that of dogs, but their plantar pads were much bigger. All this resulted in them sprinting in a manner often described as clumsy or stiff looking. Their ability to jump wasn't quite that of canines either, but they were known to swim just as well as dogs. And although they didn't run as swiftly or gracefully as wolves, their stiff tails allowed for very sharp turns. Quite frankly, the thylacine didn't require canine speeds in order to be an apex predator. Their diet largely consisted of small and slow prey. There just wasn't much demand for high-speed predation in Australia. Thylacines were very efficient hunters. Their jaws were narrow and long and held 46 teeth. That's slightly more than wolves and much more than a tiger. Thylacine teeth were less sharp than that of the canine and feline families and their bite force was much weaker, but they were still very capable of delivering very powerful bites. Their sense of smell, while good, was nowhere near as acute as wolves. They relied more heavily on their great sense of hearing and eyesight. Their pupils were like that of cats, often described as slit-like. This gave them remarkable night vision that made them very successful nocturnal hunters. Perhaps their biggest predatory drawback was their lack of organised social hunting. Whereas canines form packs of up to 30 wolves, thylacines almost always pursued prey alone and were only occasionally seen hunting in pairs. The solitary nature of thylacines demonstrates why they were never domesticated by humans. If only thylacines had been domesticated by humans, they may have avoided the cruel torment that was about to unfold. Just a quick reminder that liking the video and subscribing is a great way to show your appreciation and support the channel. 
A lot of work goes into each and every one of my videos, so for both our sakes, please subscribe so you don't have to miss out, and so I know that people are enjoying the content. Thank you ever so much, now let's get back to the video. 1788, the year that England started using Australia as a convict dumping ground. This marked the beginning of the end for the thylacine. Or did it? Or did it? Thylacines were already struggling by the time that Britain found their new human recycling bin. The Aboriginal Australians that had lived there for at least 70,000 years had already battered thylacine populations. The introduction of their beloved dingoes 6,000 years ago was the true beginning of the end for the thylacine. Despite the thylacine's superior size, dingoes being more efficient hunters competed strongly for food. By the time the English arrived in 1788, thylacine had been long extinct in mainland Australia. Just 4,000 specimens remained, all on the island of Tasmania, protected by their isolation from the mainland. That was until the arrival of the British convicts in 1788, who would go on to drive thylacines to complete extinction. In 1830, commercial farming of sheep began in Australia, and thylacines had already been perceived as a threat to livestock. First came private bounties, and eventually the now infamous government bounty scheme. In 1887, the colonial government placed a one pound bounty on fully grown thylacines. That's equivalent to about 100 pound in today's money. You would be awarded about half that for the hunting of infant thylacines. This cruel scheme was put in place with the sole intention of driving thylacines to extinction. In 1930, the last killing of a wild thylacine took place, but it was too late. 1933 marks the last ever confirmed sighting of a wild thylacine. In 1936, the last ever known thylacine died in captivity due to suspected neglect from Hobart Zoo. It's been calculated that thylacines didn't truly meet extinction until the 1960s, and in 1984, thylacines were officially declared extinct. Not everyone agrees that thylacine went extinct, however. So could the thylacine still be alive? Tasmania is 64,000 kilometers squared, and much of that land is unexplored territory. It's quite plausible that small groups of thylacine silently prowl the dark nights of Tasmania to this day. What's more, there have been countless reported sightings of thylacines since their supposed extinction, some from very reputable sources. We're yet to acquire conclusive evidence, but the effort to find a live thylacine specimen has not faltered. If someone were to succeed in this task, they would be owed a whopping $1.3 million by this gentleman, Stuart Malcolm. Isn't it ironic? Photographing a thylacine today will get you 1,000 times the relative worth of murdering one 100 years ago. The laugh of it is, it turns out thylacines were hardly ever a threat to livestock in the first place. They did eat sheep on occasion, but the numbers were completely blown out of proportion and panicked hysteria was caused for almost no reason. The thylacine is now one of the most beloved animals in natural history. Naturologists will continue searching for it. Scientists will try to resurrect the species through genetics. But given a few more years, we may just be doing the very same thing for Indian elephants, whales, mountain gorillas, black rhinoceroses, sea turtles, and so many more beautiful creatures. Let the story of the thylacine be a devastating reminder that we have a responsibility to protect nature's animals. That's your lot, folks. <laughs>